Hello and welcome back to my series as I build my way through the magazines, the battle games in Middle Earth. It's been months since I've recorded one of these and there's a good reason for it, I think. I started episode 33, uh, actually magazine 36, uh, and I cracked on with it and then completely lost any interest. I was not enjoying the build, I was not feeling like I was doing a good job, and because of that, and because I'm not going to do something I'm not enjoying, that's, that's not what this is about, this is about me having fun and putting it on camera for people to watch or not watch, I just put it to one side. But also, because I want to complete every magazine, I felt like I couldn't carry on, I couldn't jump over that one, uh, so it just sat there for months, literally. And now I've decided, you know what, cut your losses, bin that one off, Bin Magazine's 36 off, which is an elven watchtower, which is an absolutely awesome build and better crafter than me would do a great job. I was very unhappy with what I did. And jump onto Magazine 37. So this is episode 33, which is Magazine 37, which is the watchtower at Amonsul, uh, Weathertop. So yeah, we're Weathertop, not Amonsul, whatever. Weathertop. It is Weathertop. <laughs> so we're going to get stuck into this. It's going to be a pretty simple build, I think. It's not going to have any kind of advanced part to it, uh, mainly because I'm getting myself back into it and uh, also because I'm not sure what to do. Uh, this is actually going to be a two-part series about Magazine 37 because after the build, which is Weathertop, they also take you through the ferry, um, which is the, well, the Hobbits take to escape the Black Riders. Uh, now, I made that a long time ago myself just for fun so I've already built that so I've got an awesome collaboration lined up and I'm really hoping and as I stand here recording this we haven't yet played it but I'm really hoping that Angela and I are going to get to play the scenario and play it over my existing terrain and I'll also as I say have this awesome collaboration lined up which I'm very excited but I'm not going to say any more about now uh, and that should be uh, a coming out a month from the Tuesday when this comes out. Now it's April, so it's going to be the first uh, Tuesday in May that you'll be seeing this, which means that that game uh, and uh, collaboration video will be the first Monday in June. Anyway, long rambly introduction, as is traditional for the Battle Games of Middle Earth videos. I'm going to now get the magazine, we're going to have a look through it, see what the build is and get it started. I'm really looking forward to this, I love that scene in the films and I think the terrain really suits my style so hopefully I'll get back into it and now we can rock and roll on and get through the rest of the magazines over the next couple of years. But we shall see. Lesson learned here, if you're not enjoying something, put it away and move on. Don't let it become a long term a block because that's just silly isn't it? Anyway, let's get on with this build. I was right, it is Amonsul. I thought it was, but I questioned myself then. Anyway, the Watchtower at Amonsul, also called Weathertop, is a setting for one of the most exciting sequences of the Fellowship of the Ring movie. Here we take a look at how to recreate this haunted, ruined Watchtower. Brilliant. So, built by King Elendil in the latter years of the Second Age, the Watchtower of Amonsul stood as a proud beacon against the evil of Mordor. Now it is a ruined and ominous place, although it is easily a defendable position, makes it a place of shelter for weary travellers in the wilds. So yeah, we're going to look at doing that and we're going to make Buckleberry Ferry, easy for me to say. But like I say, that will be a video next week, next month. So we're going to be looking for 5 centimeter thick polystyrene, knife, sand and gravel, 2 centimeter thick styrene, some wooden dowel, thin card, textured wallpaper, foam card, stones, cork and paint and all the normal stuff. So I have, just to the right of here, this, a big sheet of thick, I think it's actually, I think it's five centimeter thick polystyrene. It's actually the last one I've got in stock, so I need to go to the shop and pick some more up. And I'm gonna use that for step one. Now step one is this. The rocky hill of Weathertop is an imposing terrain feature in itself. Mark a roughly circular shape, about 42 centimeters, seven inches, 17 inches in diameter on a piece of thick polystyrene. This forms the area where the ruined tower will sit. So this is actually the, the hill underneath the tower, which is pretty cool. So then what you want to do is cut that out and make it a bit irregular and a bit messy. You don't want it rocky looking uh, and they're suggesting that you literally pop the polystyrene. Now I'm not going to do that because A, I hate mess and B, it's silly, it's not going to be very strong. So I will be making use of modelling compound to do the rocks and finish off and make it a little bit more irregular. Um, but of course if you don't have that then feel free to bobble your mess everywhere and have something that doesn't 
isn't very secure uh, a little bit of glue my pva glue treatment over it will hold it in place but not for lots of play anyway so what it then says is once you've done that you will need to make a couple of one or two areas in the hill where models could feasibly climb to the top so the trick here is to get yourself a miniature and this is not a um, an sbg miniature this is actually for uh a gunfighter's ball, but get a miniature and use a miniature to work out to make sure that any slope that you're doing is not going to tip it over and it's not going to slip down. So that's the thing, use a miniature to work out to make sure that they can climb up. And you can do that either as a slope or a couple of ledges. So what I'm going to do is get a pen and a tape measure and move the camera and I'll come back and show you how I'm going to draw that out and I'll probably use my um, sharp knife or my hot wire cutter to cut it um, and then uh, yeah then it's so uh, then we'll move on to the next step so let's do step one. So actually the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this sheet in half it's 50 centimeters by 50 centimeters this square and I've got this cool styro cutter profi from Probow team which is a very expensive hot wire cutter kit that I don't use very often. But one of the reasons I bought it is it's got this um, 90 degree cutter guide, which is really, really useful for this kind of thing. So it takes some heating up. I need to hold it down to heat it up. Um, and uh, it, but once it's heated up, it will cut through really quickly. So um, I will just show you that. Um, I will, uh, will put some music on while I'm doing it because it's going to take a minute to heat up. It makes a kind of flickering noise and the and it starts flashing and then once it's to, to temperature which happens like that oh, I won't put any music on so I'll keep talking it will cut through really 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 easily look at that this is the reason why I bought this and I don't use it as much as I thought I would but it's very, very good for this kind of thing. I've got it on a bit hot, actually. There we are, you shouldn't see that smoking. It's a bit too hot. Uh, but yeah, we are, so there we are. So now I've got that cut, what I'm gonna be able to do is mark out the template and the shape that I want, and then I can use my Proxon to cut around that because I won't have this huge overhang which will get in the way of doing the edges of the shape. So I will get that marked out and then take you over to the Proxon and we'll get it cut. My uh, Proxon is in a bit of an odd corner. It's a bit difficult to get to, <laughs> but it's okay. So I have drawn a shape on my polystyrene. And what I'm now gonna do is, I don't need to follow it completely accurately, but it's just there to give me, and keep me honest, really. I'm gonna come along and shave the bits off like this. So the Proxon is really, really good for this kind of thing. Um, if you want to have an angled cut, you could move the blades, move the cutter slightly to give you a more of an angle, but I've got it set to 90 degrees at the moment. And what I'll do is I'll cut each side, basically. So this will now pull off to over here. Get that out of the way and come in and start on the other side. So you can see it's going to be quite a nice, easy process to follow. As long as I can keep those corners relatively smooth, but it doesn't matter really because like, I, like I've said, I am going to be um, coming along with the modeling compound and also hacking into this with another hot wire cutter to get the rocky effect. So uh, yeah, I'll get this done. Same technique on the other two halves, on the two sides, and uh, bring you along for the next step when I get to it. So the next step involves the hot wire cutter as well, and uh, this is all about doing the slope. So what it says to do is to have like a, a literally a ramp running up the side, so from here going up to there. And it suggests very wisely that the best way to do this is actually to slice a bit off I slice the edge off, use that, trim that, and then stick it back on again. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to come along here, um, and it's going to be about that wide. I'm just going to slice in as straight a line as I can all the way along. It doesn't matter if it's not completely straight, because I'm just going to glue it back in place anyway. So uh, any little wobbles and wibbles will help me to position it 
um, more accurately. So we'll cut that off and then we'll go over, draw a line and I'll come back and I'll also cut with the Proxon the slope. So I'll be back in a second to show you how I'm going to do the slope. This, uh, what I've done is I've marked on what my slope's going to be. And again, not worrying too much about being 100% accurate, but I'm going to roughly follow that to give me the ramp up that will allow access onto the top of Weathertop by these, by the miniatures. So yeah, really good idea this. Works probably better if you've got a prox on than if you haven't, because trying to cut something like this is not the easiest thing in the world without a prox on. But what you can see here now is if I offer that up, that's going to be a really nice access up the side of the cliff. So what I'm now going to do is use my hot wire foam factory cutter to uh, do some, um, maybe add another little access point on the back corner over here uh, and also score in the uh, stone effects so that it's not such a neat straight up side. So I'll go over to the other side of the bench and we'll do that. So here we have a rather precipitous edge which doesn't look very rocky at all, even if I, when I do come to add on my uh, modeling compound, it's not going to look very good. So I've got my magic wand type thing, and I'm going to come along and literally just carve in dints like this in a random way, and that will give it a much more rugged appearance and make it look much more like a cliff. I've never really found a good magic wand tool for hot wire. I do have the, oh, that expensive one, which does come with magic wand tools, but I've not used it yet, which is a bit silly. I should try it out. But I'm not going to do it for this one. I'm just going to go around the whole of the rest of this. I'll stop filming because this is a bit difficult, a bit awkward. I'll go around the whole of this, cutting out little lines and little drop-ins, maybe not even all doing them vertically, do some at an angle. And when we come to paint that and put the uh, rest of the scenery material on it, that will give a really good cliff face uh, effect. So I'll get that done. And now we come to the final bit for this evening. Uh, I'm really enjoying this. Such a good decision to just throw away that other build and, and crack on. <laughs> what I'm going to do, um, I've finished doing the cutting and the trimming around all the edge of the large piece. And I'm now going to stick this side piece back on. So I'm going to make use of this Moment Fix Extreme, which is what I really like using a lot at the moment. Moment, huh? So I'm going to apply a squeeze of that. Um, I've also stuck some uh, cocktail sticks in, as you can see, just to act as a little bit more structure. Um, I'll put this glue on and then press it in place and then leave it overnight. And then we'll come to the next step when we get to it. But it's going to be as simple as this. Leave it flat on the bench so that you get the line, get it lined up. Look down on top so that you get it front and back properly. And then push it in. Like this. And there we are. Let's press it right in place. Not too worried about a gap showing up. Uh, if a bit of a... Um, cocktail stick pokes through just kind of break it off because we are going to be putting some more texture over the top of this so it doesn't really matter or push it in with another hard object but that there has joined up very nicely as you can see and uh, that will work really well if I get my uh, non-SPG miniature you can see it's very very easy no problem at all with climbing that step and that gap uh, I haven't yet cut out another access back here still humming and ahhing about it if I do that I'll bring you along show how I'm going to do it uh, but for the time being that's going to be me for now just pleased to get back to it frankly and start building a, um, a battle games middle earth things again and uh, starting off with, in style with uh, with weathertop how cool well, as you can see this has glued up nicely pretty happy with that pretty solid that's going to work very very well so I'm going to put that to one side now because the next thing is to do the base now what it says for the base is to get a large disc of polystyrene 
uh, with another styrene ring on top to form a tiered outer ring. So it says use a pair of compasses or a suitably sized circular object about 30 centimeters in diameter, 12 inches. And as it happens, for Rosie's birthday, we bought her a cake and it came on, you can still, I have washed this honest, but it's still a bit, bit stained. This is the base that the cake came on and it is 30 centimeters wide, which is absolutely spot on and perfect. I also have this white polystyrene here, which I'm gonna use. This was packing material with the um, enclosure I got from Tukari for my uh, FDM printer. For, um, so I've only just received this, so I just uh, made it um, up last week. Uh, so this is the perfect de um, depth, it's two centimeters, which is what it says to use. Um, and I'm gonna be able to make use of this to cut out both of the um, circles it says to do. So basically what you're gonna do is you want to take, um, so what it says is, okay, so what it says is to make three of these. So use this to cut out three circles. So if I get myself my pen and draw around this, um, I might find that I need a, a, a better pen than I've got up here actually, to be honest, because this is a very thick marker. Just one second, let me see if I've got a thinner one. Right, I found myself a better pen, a thin liner. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw around this 30 centimeters, which is perfect. And the good thing is, is that I can now offer this up. And yes, look, I'm gonna be able to get four circles out of this one sheet. So I'm gonna get this marked up. And then what I'll do is I will bring you back for when I'm gonna do the cutting. What I'll probably end up doing is cutting this into four sections and then using the Proxon with this uh, very, very tightly clamped down to uh, act as a guide. But I'll bring you along when I come to do the cutting. But for now, I'm just gonna draw around and split this up. So into, th um, I might actually only be able to get three out of one. Yeah, I think I'm gonna get three out of one. So I'm gonna draw around this and get the three that I need out of this one sheet. Um, I'll bring you back when I come to do the cutting. So when I went over to the Proxon, I realized I do actually own a circle cutter tool, which I do use and I like using. And when I looked at it, I realized that the largest it allows is 30 centimeters. So I've had a couple of goes and I've cut out two circles there, as you can see at 30 centimeters. So I thought I'd show you how I'm having to do this because 30 centimeters means it's right at the limit of the size that the Proxon will allow. So what I'm having to do is actually really trim down these edges because when it's being turned, this will actually hit against the frame and then stop and then it's annoying. And that's why you'll see on my first attempt, I've got quite a few kind of like little holes and what have you that aren't really ideal, but it doesn't matter because it's a ruined watchtower anyway. This is getting a bit bubbly. Um, oh, there's actually some sellotape still on that. I'll get rid of that. So I'm having to cut off the corners. So I'll just get that done. And then the second thing that I need to do is mark the center because the circle cutting tool is awesome. I mean, I love it, it's really, really good. But the problem you've got is it's very, very hard to locate exactly the center of the, um, of the hole. And particularly when you're doing something which requires this much accuracy, it's a bit of a pain. So what I'm doing is I'm getting a pen and marking out the center of the, cir of, of the circle roughly. So uh, about here, and then just making sure that that's gonna be not going to uh, clash it's actually going to allow me to cut. So I actually need to come across a little bit further. I've got a limited space on this dimension. That's going to be very tight, but that'll be okay. So with that hole located, well, the center located, what I'm doing is I'm taking a bradle and I'm pushing the bradle through. And then I leave the bradle through. And now let's go over to the Proxon. So here we are at the Proxon, and this is the fiddly bit. Because what I need to do, and what I've been doing with, the, with this bradle, is using it to actually locate the pin, and then put the pin, which is in the center of the circle cutting tool, you see the little nail here, right in the hole that I've put for the bradle. Trying to align it up by eye just wasn't working, so leaving the bradle stuck through makes it a bit easier. So I'm gonna try and do this on camera. I've done it twice now, 
Fingers crossed, third time's a charm, and I don't muck it up because I'm filming. So let's see, hopefully I'll try and stay out of shot as well. So hopefully you'll be able to see what I do. So just turn the proxon on, and then looking through, wait for it to dink. There we are, that's reached. Turn the proxon off, take the bridle out, drop it in the hole, there we are. And now we can turn the proxon back on and do the cut. There we are, that's close enough for me. <laughs> Had a little bit of a wobble actually, which caused that little divot there, but that's good. So, so what I now need to do is move this to be 27 centimeters, which is the next cut. And I'm actually gonna cut out the inside of two of these um, discs. So I'm gonna need to do roughly the same idea to actually get it um, situated. It's a bit awkward this, as you can tell, it's not, it's not ideal, it'd be nicer if this was longer so you could kind of, I don't know, I'm not sure how we'd do it better actually. But this is going to be a bit of a pain. Um, I'm obviously going to end up with a little bit of a, um, of a, of a cut line as I cut through. Um, but I'm just going to have to be as accurate as I can. So let's try this again. I need to do this for two of them only, uh, not for the third one. The third one will be the base. So let's see if I can cut out a 27 centimetre circle in the middle. So I'm just pausing to do my maths. So I'm gonna do a little bit of work because that was a 27, that's only gone in one and a half centimeters. I need to go in three centimeters. So I think what I need to do actually is go one, two, three, down to 24. Hmm. I think. Because it needs to be a three centimeter wide um, gap. This is going to be the one I'm going to use for the uh, for the ruined rim, ring, obviously. <laughs> Let's get rid of that. Um, you don't need to keep as much of that, uh, of the ruined one, as I do for the main one. So once I've got this right, I can do the other one better. Uh, so yeah, let's give that another go. Hmm, yeah. Just about. Okay, this is slipping quite a lot. It's not very well wedged in. So I might need to be a little bit more careful as well because as you can see that slipped here and made a little divot. Anyway, I have a ring and I have the center ring. It says not to throw anything away. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do the same cut um, but on, the, uh, on another circle um, and hopefully this will work. Uh, it's a bit off. It's a bit weird. I think this is going to have to be the, the damaged one. I'm going to have to be a little bit more careful to get right in the centre for the next one. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll get that cut and I'll bring you back for the next step when I get to it. Okay, so that worked well. This was the final one I did and you can see I really got that joined nicely. So the next step is to glue this ring on top of the solid one that I didn't cut the centre out and then glue the whole thing down to the base. So once again, I'm gonna make use of toothpicks. Um, and I think, yes, I think I can. I think if I push a toothpick right through the middle one, I can use the same toothpick to join, give it just a little bit more structure between the base, the middle, um, the middle ring, and the, uh, the and the and this top one, uh, and I'm also going to make use of Moment Fix Extreme again. So uh, yeah, simple as that. It won't take me very long. Push the cocktail stick right the way through. Top tip: twist, because then you get um, you don't push as much of a bobble out the bottom. Makes it a little bit more secure. Um, I'll get that done. I'll probably put three in. I think. So let me do that. What I'll do now is I will put the glue on. 
So, if you don't have this, PVA will work fine. It will just take a little bit longer to dry. If you do use PVA, I'm just spread it thinly because it is air drying. So if you do it too thick, it will just never dry. And you'll think it's dry, but then suddenly it will go pop and it will pop off the base. This has happened to me more than once. So now, a bit of glue there. What I'll do now is turn that over and put that in place. And I'm not going to be trying to press the cocktail sticks in. At this stage, if they don't go in, I don't mind if they push back up. As you can see, they have them. Press that down, and then I can push the cocktail sticks back down, because all I really want is just the very tip coming through the top. What I'll now do is some glue like this. There we are. And last but not least, we'll carefully press this ring down. Put that a little bit further in. There we are. We literally only just want the tip of it on. Perfect. Cool. Right, so I will let that go off and uh, bring you back for the next step shortly. Uh, I, the next step is to carve in uh, stones, uh, bricks, but I want to leave that to dry so I don't disturb it. So I want that to go off. So I'll leave that and I'll bring you back for the next step. Probably in a couple of hours when that's all gone off. So now on to step three, which is making the ruined arches. Now it suggests that you use uh, or you draw straight onto the foam, but I'm going to make a, a template here, which is uh, actually on a bit of uh, Weetabix uh, cereal box. So what it says to do is create five even, uh, arches, um, which are going to be spaced evenly around the base. Uh, each arch is made in two parts. The front part fits on the inside of the rim, while the back part fits on the hill outside. To make a ruined arch, mark out a rectangle a two centimeters thick styrene, approximately 12 centimeters wide and 14 centimeters tall. Now, as I've said, I'm using cardboard, but that is roughly 12 centimeters and that is roughly 14 centimeters. So I have uh, gone with the dimensions that they've said. Onto this, roughly draw the curve of your arch as shown with a small ledge at the front and a tapering support wall at the back. Notice how the outer edge of the arch is two centimeters lower to take into account the thickness of the base. Um, what you then do is cut that out and then what we're going to do, and I'm going to do this on, on camera because I think this is going to be interesting. So what, we, oh, clunk, what we're going to do is this line here is going to be extended up to the second. So what we're going to be keeping is this, we're keeping this and we're going to cut away here and we are going to want to make that gap here the width of the ring and that is going to be three centimeters isn't it which is what i did yes three centimeters so we will measure three centimeters from there hopefully this is going to work well we shall see <laughs> doing this on live on camera and i'll find out i've made a mistake no that looks like it's going to be all right so we'll measure three centimeters here and three centimeters here okay so that is where we are going to do our cut and then what we will do we'll be keeping this bit here yeah this bit here and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to mark a two centimeter wide section and i'll just do uh, two dots there just so i can get it lined up so we're going to mark a two centimeter wide section like this and no, that should be half, not a one. Pay attention, beard. So then we will draw a line here. And we'll draw a line here. And what that means is that the sections that we're going to keep is this and this. And this bit will be cut away entirely. That will sit on the outside. This will sit on the inside. And yeah, hopefully it's going to work well. <laughs> so I'm going to cut that out now out of my, uh, my template out now. I'm going to cut the whole thing out, leaving the join. Then what I'll do is I'll bring you back when I come to cutting out the first of the XPS. 
and I'm going to use XPS I think not uh, not white foam and then once I've got the five shapes cut out what I'll do is I will cut out these uh, this center bit and then slice and make that slice as well so i'll bring you along when i come to do the cutting of the xps anyway i'm just going to slice this out now i'm going to use a sharp knife rather than scissors uh, but yeah that was a bit more involved than i expected but hopefully that's going to look nice all right so i've cut out my template here and what i've got here is some xps some hard xps which means i can do this with a knife rather than having to use a hot wire cutter but what i am going to do with a hot wire cutter is i'm going to trim off the um, texture because I don't want it. So what, what I've got, what I've done is I've made sure that these chunks of this XPS are the right size for my template. I need to make five of these. So that means I've got enough here. I could just trim that across. And then what I'll do is I'll put this through the hot wire cutter taking about half a millimeter or a millimeter off each side. That will just shave off the texture. And then I'll be able to do the drawing and the cutting of the, uh, of the template. So I'll get that done and then uh, draw around each of these five times and then I'll show you how I'm going to do the cutting. I'm not too worried about the um, about, about this being too accurate because it's a ruin so I don't mind using the knife and with this XPS it's really really solid it doesn't bubble so it's going to be easier to cut with the knife. So I'll get that done I'll bring you back for the next step. Okay so I've cut one out just as a test there it is it's worked okay. I've deliberately extended the archway quite a long way forwards so that I can cut them all at a slightly different length to make it a little bit more random. Uh, and I'm probably not going to do very much of this cutting on the uh, camera because it's actually not very easy for me to see with it so low down. But basically what I'm doing is I've got my sharp knife um, and I'm coming in and slicing like this. So you're not looking at doing it all in one go. You're looking at pulling through in multiple passes to make a nice clean cut and that's how you do that sort of thing so we'll cut there as well because that's another one i need to do and then there's another cut here at the bottom i just need to make sure i get actually on the line there we are cool so yeah it just takes a little bit of time um literally to show you as well just how thin the bit that i shaved off was for the texture there it is it's like a sheet of paper <laughs> Um, if you're doing uh, sci-fi stuff, that is going to be really cool um, for making like a corrugated iron walkways or whatever, or texturing up something. Um, so that's really good to save if you're doing that sort of t uh, terrain. I don't do so much of it, so I probably won't save that. But yeah, that's a really cool thing. But anyway, there we are. That's, that's how I'm going to do it. Just carefully carve away, making sure to um, not try and go through in one go but just to slice it carefully um, and we'll end up with our with our archways now this was the bit of the entire build that I was the most nervous about because this is the bit that I do the least well is r uh, multiple repetitive shapes but I suppose I was slightly more comfortable about it because it's supposed to be a ruin <laughs> so if I if they don't look the same then then it's fine <laughs> so that kind of calmed me down. The other thing just to say, which is why I'm carrying on, is if you don't cut all the way through with this stuff, you can just kind of like snap it and it works quite well. Anyway, I have this one to finish and then three more to do. Um, and then I'll bring you back for the next step, which is going to be cutting out the center and then fitting them in place. All right, so now I'm starting to do the cutting. So what you can see here is in my template, I've chopped out that middle bit, which went there before. And so I've now got two parts, which is what I want. And what I've done is I've cut out the first template as well. So that's what we're going to end up with. So this part here slots in just like that. And I can score down around the template like this. And then cut that shape. Oh, difficult sometimes holding things when you're trying to keep your hands out of the way of the camera. <laughs> So yeah, let's just make sure that's right. There we are. I mean, it's a ruin, thankfully. So it's not the biggest thing in the world if it's a bit scraddish, which is why I'm liking this. <laughs> and then the second part will sit in like this and we'll be cutting out that space down there. So yeah, that's that. That's how I'm doing this. So I will get that done on this one and the other three. 
and then we'll get them glued in place and I think that'll be me done for the day. I'm making really good progress on this. So yeah, I'm just gonna sit down and cut these out and I'll bring you back for the next step very shortly. All right, so those are all cut. And what I'm now gonna do is stick them in place here. So you guessed it, I'm gonna use my super strong moment fix extreme to glue these in place. I don't think I'm gonna bother you putting any, um, any cocktail sticks in. I might do. Uh, but basically, just going to glue, put a bead of glue along the bottom and a bead of glue there and press it in place. It's pretty strong this stuff, it's got really good grab which makes it perfect for this kind of thing where you want it to be upright and what have you. Uh, so yeah, and what I'll be doing is once these are all glued in place, I will then come along with my knife once it's all set and I can see how they all look and I'll be able to trim off the top, the, this edge here in an uneven way. But I'm not going to do that now because I want to just see what it looks like before I go ahead with that. The other thing to say is you can see that the gap is not very wide. Probably this should have been a bit bigger um, or this, um, and uh, then, then there would definitely have been a gap there for me just to go through. But it is what it is. I'm happy enough with it, I'm not going to start again on that. Um, if you ever want a miniature to go through there, you just say, well, they can. And if they can't make it through, you just remember that there's an extra inch that they can move next turn or whatever. So it won't be too bad for the playability, just, just have to bear it in mind. The other thing is, and I'm not sure how I'm going to do this, is working out um, how uh, working out the, the, the fifths. So the, there's, there's five of these, so I need to put them a fifth of the way around each of the circles. Um, and so, yeah, you can see that I do definitely need to trim them down because at the moment they meet. Um, so I just need to make sure that they are going to actually go in the right places and not look odd. Um, and then, yeah, get them all glued in. So I'll get that done. I'll let you know what I learn, what I work out. I think that's looking pretty good, my guess is. Uh, my guess is it's is, is, is looking all right now. Um, and yeah, I'll leave that to go off overnight and we'll come back tomorrow to do the next step, which I don't know what it is. I haven't looked, but uh, yeah. I think by the top's looking quite good already. Definitely need to trim those off though, as you can see, they currently meet in the middle, which is a good accident. <laughs> uh, if only I wanted it to do that. So these are now nicely, nicely stuck. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna start to hack away at them and take bits out. <laughs> so for example, I'm literally gonna come in here with my knife and cut that out. I could probably have done this before sticking it down, it might have made it a bit easier actually. Um, but hey, you live and learn, and uh, I don't always do everything in the right order. So yeah, I'm gonna hack away and see what I can come up with to make it look a little bit more random. Um, and uh, I will bring you back for the next step, which is going to be um, putting on things around, I believe. Uh, so using the other ring to do a little bit of a of like the where it goes between these. I'll bring you back for that when I get to it. But for now, I'm just going to hack and destroy. Well, the next step isn't putting the uh, top level on; it's putting on the steps, which does make sense. So what I've done here, what I'm going to do here, is there's two types of steps. The first one I'm going to make is uh, the long steps, as they're called, and the other one is the curved steps. So we're going to do long steps first. So first of all, what we need to do is measure the distance between the outer rim and the inside of this, um, of, of these uprights, of these pillars, and it's four centimeters. So what I've then got is the inner disc that I cut out from the center, and I've measured four centimeters in from the edge, as you can see there. So what I'm now going to do is try to use my circle cutter again, but be a little bit smarter with it. So let's drag the camera over and show you what my idea is. Okay, so here what I've got is I've got the circle cutter. And what I've done is I've put the polystyrene that I want to cut already onto the, um, onto the pin. And I'm very, very carefully slotting that in place like that. Now if I rotate that round so that my dot is in line, um, what I should be able to do, um, if you remember when I first did this, I had problems with this sliding. I actually think that's what you're supposed to do. 
It's, it's not great because, um, but if you were, if, say for example, you had a something lined up uh, which would allow you to know when you were in line with this number, you would be able to slide this in and reach uh, the point you want to uh, for the cut, which didn't make much sense, but you'll see what I mean now. So if I turn that on and slide this in, I'm going to be able to cut until I get to my circle, hopefully. Got a bit stuck there, there we are. And now I can do my rotation in line. And what that means is I have been able to cut basically exactly where I wanted to start without lots of hunting and searching, apart from that last little bit where it got a little bit stiff, which is a bit of a shame. Um, so that worked well, good. That was my idea and it worked. So what I now have is, if I lift that off, what I now have is here, I'm going to be able to cut a, uh, the angle to fit in correctly uh, between the two uh, um, pillars and then I'll be able to slice out the steps and that will fit in very, very nicely as the, uh, what they're calling the long steps. It will also be the correct shape for the other style of steps, but we'll come to that in a second. So what I'm going to do now, take it over to the tower. Uh, marking where I need to put my cut, where I need to cut, um, and then I'll probably just do that very carefully with a knife. So let's go back over there and finish this one off, this step <laughs> of making steps off. So this is going to be a little bit fiddly, and I do wonder whether I shouldn't have done this before gluing these uprights in, but anyway, what we've got is we have the cut, and I'm positioning this so that it is uh, between two of the pillars and what I can then do is mark roughly like this where to cut. Right, I will now use my sharp knife to slice that so just give me one second. Okay first attempt was slightly too big but that's better than too small so what I'm going to need to do is trim off a little bit more so let me just rotate the camera to my cutting area and then what we can do because again, I just use this sharp knife and I can very carefully. Now do bear in mind that I am going to be coming in with some modeling compound on this. So my work is, my, my uh, build is going to actually handle the fact that these might be slightly um, wrong because I can fill it in with the, with the modeling compound. But what I'm going to do is just very carefully shave down until I can slot it in place. Nearly nearly very nearly actually yeah very very nearly just a little bit more on this one I think there we are All right let's move the camera around again so you can see I'm putting it in a slightly different area uh, putting it in around there but that fits in absolutely perfectly so now I need to pull that out without damaging it oops <laughs> okay so the next step is going to be to put the steps on. So sorry about the lots of swinging the camera around. But what I'm going to do here is come along and basically cut there. I'm only going to do two steps. I don't think it would work very well doing three. And I think actually this is where I'm going to really regret using the bobbly white foam. Because if I was using the normal foam this would be quite easy to do. But yeah, I'm basically going to remove that section. Um, I'm going to have to do two of these style of steps. Um, so I'll get this done off camera, work out my technique, and then bring you back, hopefully, and show you the success or failure of it. So yeah, I'm just going to use a knife for this, though. Well, there you are. That worked. So literally just using a very, very gentle but regular cutting motion I was able to cut that out and that worked well. So what I've now got to do is make the other style which is where the steps go don't go from the inside like this they are stepped from low to high up here. So I will get the um, this this remains of this section here which is the um, hoop that I uh, the rim that I bring that I cut up will chop off less than the distance between the two because it needs to go for, needs to have access for it for the for the um, 
uh, for the models and then we'll do the same technique to step it up and I'll bring you along for that one. So I'll get that measured and cut and then bring you along for the steps to show you how I'm doing that with the knife. Okay, so I've used my fine liner to mark on where I want to do the cuts and I'm using the same knife and literally what you're doing and I won't do all this on camera because it is a bit of a nasty sound but what you're looking at doing very carefully because you're cutting towards your hand which is not the ideal thing is just cutting like that multiple gentle slices not trying to force it trying to put up with that squeak sound and it cuts out like that so let's do the next step so line it up nicely keeping it nice and even if possible again we're helped by the fact that what we're doing here is a ruin <laughs> I would probably suggest trying to use masking and a hot knife if you need it to be perfect but that is very much good enough so what I'll do now is use the same extreme power glue glue that in place and uh, then we yeah we've got some steps I might make another one I've got um, two of the um, long steps and if I have two of these then I think that'll probably be a really good way of having the access um, and there'll be a lot of rubble around anyway when it's done so uh, if we spin the camera around a bit I'll show you where that's going to go so this one will fit in very nicely in there as you can see so I'll get the glue and stick that in and then I'll bring you back for the next step when I get to it so the next step is to do steps up from the outside into the uh, the the, the, the tower. So what I've got here is a block of expanded polystyrene that I've trimmed down to be the correct height. You can see that matches across there. And I've then taken the spare inner disc and using a pencil marked out a line and then very carefully cut that using a knife and you can see that I've got a curve. So I'm going to do that again for the other one for another one. What I've got here is another block. These are all a little bit big at the moment, but that's fine. Uh, this one I'm going to make, uh, probably put actually at the back here, but that's out of sight, so you won't be able to see what I'm talking about. So I'll just talk you through what I'm gonna do. Uh, what I'm gonna do is the same kind of thing here in terms of cutting out the, uh, the um, cutting out so that it can marry up there. Um, and then this one will have uh, a steps that will lead up towards the um, towards this kind of like up right here towards this pillar here this one is probably going to go back here and this one is probably going to go here and this is going to be steps cut in like that so going forwards and towards and that will be sat in the center of this kind of area over the back so conceptually like that so I'm going to do the same kind of like area of, of uh, arc here so that it will marry up against the side um, I might do and I might split this a little bit smaller, maybe even split it in half so that I can have one set of um, stairs going up or maybe not even in half. Um, I might make that a bit smaller anyway because I need to have access in maybe three places I think. I need to have access back here. I definitely need to have access here because this is where the ramp comes up and I'm thinking about one here. So these are going to be the outside steps. So I'm going to get that done now and uh, I'll show you what they look like when they're done. I'll be using the same technique to cut the steps in as I did for these interior ones. Um, so yeah I'll get that all done, glued in place and then show you what it looks like when it's finished. So the next step is making pillars and it suggests using dowel or some kind of uh, decorative uh, wood. However, that's something that we just don't get here. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I haven't been able to find. So I have had an idea and I'm gonna see whether it works. We're gonna try it out. So these are little wooden sticks. They are actually hobby sticks. Um, I do think I did actually buy these in, uh, in Bulgaria, but I'm not totally sure. I might have done, I might not have done, can't remember. Um, but yeah, they're just basically, I mean, you could use uh, bamboo skewers, uh, barbecue skewers uh, would be a good option as well. And my idea is, basically, if I get a few out, I've no idea if this is going to work, but my idea is to get some and glue them together in a circle, so bind them together, so get some tape wrapped around, use some PVA to glue them together, and then once they're dried, once that's fully dried, then cut them, and I can use them as my uprights. And I think that'll look quite nice, I think it'll look like a, a fluted column, I think that's what it's called. Um, I have to work out roughly of how many I'll want to have per column, um, and try to 
get them to be well there's actually a a spiky one that probably shouldn't be in there <laughs> actually i think i remember now actually these are actually spares that's what this is this is a this is a bag of these that i've saved from previous builds goodness me i've forgotten that yeah so they're all going to be odd and what have you but they should be okay or roughly the same diameter so yeah so i'll do them like that i think and what it calls for is it calls for two between each of the uh, actual um of these uprights so of the arches so yes yeah, so i'm going to get that done uh, i'll get one done off camera make sure it works and then i'll do the next one on camera and show you what it looks like uh, just to be clear it says that they should be about seven centimeters tall um, and then what will happen is then we'll have the ring going around here and they will support um, a, uh, a little bit more of, of the ceiling there so i'm gonna get that done like i say my plan is a bit of masking tape to tie it together at the top of the bottom pva glue to uh, seal it to to glue it together leave it overnight and i'll tr look in the morning see whether it's worked see if it will cut down and not split and what have you um, Another idea I had was actually to put strips of uh, masking tape to make it look, uh, you know, to add some details. So I might even do that and that will help bind it together. So uh, I might even leave some of the masking tape on and only cut at the top at the right height. Um, so yeah, anyway, I'll show what it looks like. I'm man nuttering away because I'm working out of my head like while I'm talking. Um, but that looks like quite a good number. How many have we got there? Two, four, six, seven. Yeah, seven looks like a good number. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I'll bring you back, show what it looks like let's give it a go oh this has worked well i think so you can see here taped it together and i've coated it with a um, pva which has made it quite solid i'm not able to break that apart there i'm putting quite a lot of pressure on that so that's really good so what i'm going to do now i've realized i need to make two four six eight ten of these so i've got one so i need to make nine more like that which is going to take some time so i'm going to sit down now and knock nine of those out but first of all as i promised i'm going to show you how i did it even though it's pretty obvious so let me just get seven of the skewers out of this pot out of this bag four five six seven there we are so that's seven skewers so we can arrange that into quite a neat little kind of like um, stack like that get some masking tape and what I'm doing is tearing it off and then masking the top and the bottom of this little stack so we'll do that it was less effort to do this when i wasn't filming i can tell you it's easier than when you're trying to keep it in shot as is often the case but there we are so we've masked that top and now we can ma mask the bottom now we can mask the top like so so there we are we have a stack so what i'll do i'll grab myself a brush and this piece of XPS because what I do I have watered down PVA which means it's going to soak in quite nicely go into the gaps and fill it all in so we just paint that over like so then also over the top of the of the masking tape so get it in the cracks and in the gaps like this and what i also did was actually dipped it into the glue so we sealed the end like that and you can knock the excess off so there we are that's nicely coated and then push it into the xps and that means that it dries without sticking to other things I don't want it to stick to so that's two I've done I need to make another eight I'll get them done now and then show what it looks like what the next step is going to be when I get to it but this is working nicely quite pleased I had that idea well here we are we have the pillars so what I'm now going to do is I'm going to take my Proxon mini table saw and I'm going to use it for the first time <laughs> So the idea here is that these get turned into pillars that are about seven 
centimeters long. Now, uh, seven centimeters is gonna be about right for me, I think. I might make them eight because I've done this a little taller. Um, but yeah, about seven or eight centimeters tall, um, and I'm gonna cut them with this table saw all to the same length, and then I'm gonna make use either, I'm not gonna use them all um, at seven centimeters, because some I'm gonna do as broken um, or tumbled down, so I might cut some of those in half, and then I can have them as scattered terrain. But I'm gonna cut everything to seven centimeters at first, so that then I can, you know, fiddle with it afterwards. So the way that I'm gonna make sure that I get to seven centimeters and do it correctly and accurately is actually I'm gonna use some more masking tape. So let me just grab that out. That was inefficient, wasn't it? I put it away. So I'm gonna use some more masking tape. I'm gonna measure, so I'll do this on just one of them on the camera. So we'll measure that up to seven centimeters or roughly, and I will wrap masking tape around the pillar at that length there okay and what that means is when I'm cutting it will it will act to keep the actual dowels together just in case they're not quite as um, glued together as I hoped and then I can remove that masking tape once I've done the cut and it should be okay so I'm going to wrap masking tape around all of these at that area at that, at that height you can see I probably could have gotten away with gluing far fewer of these together I didn't really measure this very well did I uh, I didn't really plan this very well which is often the case um, I could have probably done half the number of dowels but hey I'll keep these and they can be used in other projects in the future um, so I could potentially even do one at 14. Yeah, I could probably get two out of this one. That would make it a bit more efficient, wouldn't it? So yeah, let's have a look at doing that. So put that at around seven, that at around 14. And that will just keep it all together, like I say, when I do the cutting. So I'll get this wrapped up, get masking tape at all the cutting locations, and then bring you along when I get the new machine out, never used it before, um, and uh, try and cut these to length. All right, so new table saw, and I have just tested it and it does work okay. So what I've got is I've got my guide in place, which is set to seven centimeters, which is what we want. Um, and I was thinking that, as I said in the previous clip, that I was gonna be able to cut this in two places, but it turns out the kick's just too much. It's not safe and I'm not gonna do it. So I've actually gone and marked up seven centimeters on all of my lengths and that's what I'm gonna do. So I'll cut one on camera and then I'll do the rest off, but just so you can show, show you how it works. It's not very noisy, so I might be able, I should be able to talk over it. So we get that started. It's noisy enough, but it's not very noisy. So I've got my pusher, you should always use your pusher. The, it's a little bit um, small actually for this pusher. So we push through and you can see that it kicks a bit which is not ideal because it's so light and so small. So it might not even be the right tool to use for cutting things this, this slim, but it has cut right through. It just kind of kicks off the last bit, which is a little bit annoying. So anyway, there's my seven centimeters. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut the rest of them to that length very carefully. Obviously I am being careful. I'm using my pusher and I'm keeping my other hand right out of the way. Do not feck around with these things. They can take your finger off as soon as blink. So yeah, if you are trying this, do be very careful. Um, don't muck about. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's going all right so far. Um, I'll get these cut and then we'll bring you along for the next step, which will be gluing them in place. I cut all those up. I had a couple that actually fell apart, so I've re-put PVA on them. I'll let them to dry overnight, but I'm gonna, uh, I'm, I might even be able to glue them in now uh, because the next step is to stick these onto the base. So what um, what I've got is I've got one, I've got two for each gap, uh, obviously with having 10. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, um, I should have two for each gap. <laughs> Can't see one now. Um, what, I'm, what I'm gonna do now is glue them in place using the uh, Moment Fix Extreme, which is gonna be nice and grabby, um, which is what I want, um, and also is going to uh, dry quite hard. So the plan will be to put a blob like that, and then taking the lovely um, pillar, press it in. And hopefully it stays up right. It doesn't matter if it's a bit wibbly wobbly, uh, because it's a 
it's a ruin. And don't worry too much about the fact that there's going to be some of this glue if you are using this glue, because I am going to come along and cover that up with most uh, with, with with other materials. So yeah, I'm going to get that done. Not all of it is going to be upright and secure. So for example, if we look at this one, let's do this one leaning inwards like that. So I'll put a dollop there and a dollop on the top. And we'll do that. And that will be a tumble down one. And I can build up the base a little bit using the glue like that. So I'll get the rest of them all glued on all the way around, let that go off. And then tomorrow we'll come and we'll do the next step, which is putting the, uh, the upper ring on over the top of these. So yeah, enjoying this, it's pretty really good fun. Now these are dried on nicely. Uh, certainly perfect and once I put the modeling compound around the base they'll be really really solid. So the next step is to put some of the um, so, so something above the pillars. So this is the leftovers of one of the rings and I've got a whole other ring over there and what we're going to be doing is I'm going to put some on top of so I'm going to put a, a continuous run going from the pillar to just past this, so this upright to just past this pillar. Um, and I'm gonna put a chunk on this one and a chunk attached to the side of another one um, to make it look like the first floor of the, of, the, of the building, the thing. So what we're gonna do is quickly measure up, rough it up like that, and then roughly cut it. It doesn't uh, have to be particularly accurate, but that could nicely go on there now as you can see and what it says to do is to mark where the pillars are and then carve a little archway in it so this will be a little bit similar in technique to how I did the curves on these outer um, outer steps in that what I'll do is I'll mark where these are there's one there and there's one there okay and I will mark a curve like that that will go between the two and then I'll make use of the hot wire cutter to hollow that out and what that will do is it will make it look like there's an archway between the two so that's one of the techniques I'm going to use um, I'll show you what that looks like the other technique as I've said is to just like basically have a, a chunk literally attached to the wall like this so I'll do that um, and what I'll be doing is I'll use a toothpick to make give that a little bit of strength because it's going to be a little bit weak otherwise uh, and then I will also probably do something pretty similar um, over here maybe I'll just do just between the two on that one actually so I'll do another cut I'll do I'll carve another archway between these two like that, mark where that is, and then, yeah, and then have that one over there. And if I want to do some more, I've got another whole uh, ring that I can cut up, but I don't want to go over the top. One of the things with this is it is going to make it a bit more difficult to play, and playability is really important for me. So I'm going to get those glued in place, get that carved out, get it stuck in place. I'll make use of the uh, same glue. Um, and as I say, I'll probably use some toothpicks just where they're, where I can. So for this one, definitely, and here I'll use a toothpick. That'll make it a little bit more secure. When that's all dried and gone off, I'll bring you back for the next step. Next step is to put some kind of ruined walls type things um, around here. So what it says to is, is where the top was once a complete tower, it helps to add some of the rem remnants of walls here and there. Glue small off cuts of foam card and styrene to the outer rim and the sides of the ruined arches. Um, and uh, basically make them look a bit ruined. So what I've got is I've got this, the black foam that I use, and I'm going to 
I use a wire brush to score it up because it's very shiny so it doesn't take any paint or anything to stick to it. And then I'm going to glue on little bits of it uh, carved and cut to look like broken stone on here. So if I shift the camera around, I'll show you how I go about processing this stuff. It's basically underfloor insulation so it's only a very thin uh, it works really really well for this kind of thing. So if we just move the camera around and down, it's like that. What I do is I have my wire brush, actually pointed down a little bit further, just one second, I'll just move the camera properly. Right, that's better. <laughs> so here is the foam, and what you need to do is you need to score it up with the wire brush to take the shine away. So if I just do this bit here, bring it up to the camera, you can see there's the scored, and there's the not scored, and you can see just how shiny it is. But once you score it, it's going to actually have things stick to it, um, allow paint to stick and other textures. I don't need all that much, so I think probably scoring up just this little section here, this is an offcut that I've saved because as long-term viewers will know, I'm tight and I do save tiny offcuts like this. And this is why I save offcuts, because you can, you can use them. So let's uh, cut a section off. Gonna need to scrape up both sides. Actually, look, I'd already scraped up the other side when I originally used this for whatever I used it for, so that's good. Um, and then what I'll do is I will cut a shape of broken down bricks. And what this will give me is actually two sections of wall. So, move those out of the way, bring the power in and this for example will get glued here and will act looking like a little bit of broken down wall and then my other piece can potentially get glued here so that's what I'm going to do I'll glue them down using the same glue as I've been using for everything um, and uh, what I, you can also do is use these as kind of, uh, when we come to the uh, future steps, when we're putting rubble and what have you, you can use the same technique to make bricks and have them scattered around the rest. So I'll probably come and do that later on. So I'll get this done. I'm not gonna glue too much in. Like I've said before, I wanna make sure this is playable. Don't wanna obstruct too much. So having, having demonstrated it here, I'm almost certainly not gonna put these underneath. Actually, I might put one underneath the, the longest bit of roof, as you can see here, but I'll probably put the rest somewhere else. So uh, I'll do a couple of sections of wall, get them glued in when they're dry and gone off. I will be back with the next step. So the next step is interior details. Um, what it says is to add texture to the inside of the ruin. Um, and to, it suggests that you either use cardboard, which I'm not gonna do, as regular viewers will know, hate it. Uh, and what it suggests that you do is you use your textured wallpaper. So I have some textured wallpaper, which I found when I was doing my bridge. Um, which I will attempt to remember to link to the video above, but it took years actually for me to find any wallpaper over here that was good, but I found some. Um, here is the roll. <laughs> it's flowery, but it's got a, it's got enough of a, of a texture look that looks a little bit like uh, cobblestones. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut chunks out uh, and glue it down. Um, and one thing I learned while doing the bridge is you really, again, and I know I use this all the time now, but you really do want to be using your extreme fix glue with this because PVA is not going to adhere it very well. So what I'll do is I will put a lump of my glue down. And this isn't the only process that's going to go on. So uh, don't worry that it looks like it's lifting a bit because we will be putting more things over the top. But that now can go in there. And if you are worried about it lifting, just like put a little lump of glue in and press it down. And it is absolutely, if you don't have, um, if you want this to stick to foam, this is the right tool for the job, right, the right glue for the job. So what I'm gonna do now is continue to patchwork in the cobbles. I will attempt to keep the lines going the straight way, the same way as I've started on that one, because I think the lines will go the same way. But having gaps isn't a problem, because once I've done this, I'm going to use modeling sand and gravel and fill in the gaps. So that will be pretty much um, filling in these gaps here where you can see there's no 
um, there's no wallpaper, I'll put some gravel there and it'll look fine. So yeah, it's gonna take a little bit of time, not that long, but just a couple of minutes to do, but I'll stop filming now and I'll uh, bring you back for the next step. The only other thing to say is the next step that they suggest to do actually is ruin stairways. They suggest that you put stairways going up I'm just not gonna do that, I don't want to. I don't feel like I've got space. I think if you're gonna put that much detail in this, this should probably be at least twice the diameter, which, who knows, I might do that. Um, but, uh, yeah, because it's not very playable. It's like, look at my hands. I can't even get two hands in, pretty much. So, it's a bit of a small model, to be honest. So I might make it, might, might make a big one in the future. Um, but yeah, let's get this um, uh, wallpaper down, and uh, then I'll bring it back when I come to do the rubble. And right, now we come to kind of fun part. So the instructions say that you'll make your model look much more realistic and convincing if you have lots of rubble around. And what I'm going to do is do that. So I have my watered down PVA here. Uh, there is a video below if you want to know how I go about making it, but it is literally just watered down PVA. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to liberally, liberally, easy for me to say, scatter this around on top of the um, gaps between the cobblestone areas. This will both seal down the edges of these bits of wallpaper, but also that's where I'm going to scatter my, my sand and gravel. So I'll get that all painted on now, so I'm going to do it all in one go. And this is just in the bed or in the, in the base between the walls. I'm going to once this is done and dried, I'm going to do another step, which is not in the magazine, but which is what I want to do. So uh, yeah, we'll just get this painted in. So give me a second. There we are. So that's painted in now. Um, and what I've got here, this is builder sand. It's nothing special. Literally, you can just see it's a bucket. And I'm going to make use of a spoon to scatter unsifted builder sand basically everywhere. Like that. Not worrying too much about being neat. Just throw it in there. So you don't need to leave this very long for PVA to grab because it dry because it's uh, it desiccates. It dries very fast when you put the sand on. So quite literally, that's as long as I need to leave it. And what I can then do is carefully upend it, make a mess everywhere, moving the bucket over just to make it a bit easier for me to pour. Literally upend it. I'll have to get the hoover out. <laughs> but what you can see, if I move the bucket back out of the way, and put that down, what you can see is that has dried on and is now got lots of gravel everywhere. So what I'm gonna do is let that go off a little bit more. Though I do see a bit there that I missed. I must have missed putting any glue at all. So you can go in um, and touch it up uh, and add a little bit more sand and then empty it off. So you can do this over multiple steps right away. Um, but I'm going to let that to basically all go off before I do the next step because I don't want anything moving um, while I'm doing this next step, which is going to involve uh, modeling compound and sealing the rest of the build. But, but yeah, it's as simple as that, it really is. You really don't have to wait long, it grabs very quickly. Um, you don't have to leave it on for uh, leave the sand sitting on top and then worry about it getting knocked or what have you. Just put it on. Wait a minute. Apprend it. Done. So uh, we'll quickly touch these bits up that I saw that I'd missed actually putting any glue on. Now what I normally do, what I often do, is I will use paint, so uh, watered down house paint with PVA mixed into it as my um, as my glue but in this case I wanted to use glue because I'm going to come in and paint the whole thing so uh, so yeah so anyway that's that so we've got gravel in there uh, I'll let that go dry like I say um, what I will do once it's dry I'll bring you back but we'll just put another coat of PVA over the top once this is uh, dried for a couple of hours um, and then we'll have a look at doing the actual um, uh, maybe using some some uh, modeling compound to fill in the gaps so um, you can see on this, particularly on this on, the, on these steps, between the steps, there's a bit of a gap there, which I'm going to need to do something about, I think. And also, I just want to make it a little bit more hard wearing. Anyway, long clip, but easy, quick method of getting 
texture onto your terrain and also making it more hard wearing uh, and uh, yeah that, that's going to look good. And what we're going to do now is going to start building up the textures around the outside of the uh, of the base which is um, I have skipped a step which was ruined stairways I just don't want them it suggests also adding statues in don't want to do that either so we're now onto the exterior details the watchtower Amundsen was built as an integrated part of the hill um, upon which it sits to represent this once the interior details are finished it is well worth building up the rocky hill around the foundations of the tower use polystyrene bits bits of cork bark available specialist hobby stores or as you can see there a big box a big tray of um, just basically bark that I picked up off the floor and dried for the last two years and gravel stones and what have you remember to leave plenty of routes for models to climb up into the tower be especially careful not to obstruct the outer steps and also suggest potentially adding a small tree which I'm also not going to do because I just don't think there's enough space for that um, I think they're cluttering it and making it unplayable. So what I've got is, as I said, this is basically uh, bark that I pick off of the um, burning stuff. We, we heat ourselves with wood. And so this is bark that has fallen off the wood that we buy to, to burn in our fires. Um, and I dr dried this for a good two years now. So it's nice and dry. It's a bit kind of dirty and what have you, but once it's all sealed, it'll be fine. And um, what I've done is I'm picking out little bits and I'm gonna stick them on around the place. So some of them are gonna go up against to the outside like this, probably quite a lot. Um, some of them are going to be flat. Like this one here is gonna act as a little bit of an obstruction. But as it says, make sure that there's a path around. So this one I might actually kind of like combine into the rocky texture. I've got a little outcropping here and I might put this so that it kind of is that rock continuing over the top. And I'm just gonna break bits of this, glue them in place using the Moment Extreme Fix. And uh, once that's in, then what I'll do is I'll come along um, and do some modeling compound um, to smooth everything off, harden it up because it's not very hard wearing at the moment. Um, and I will embed some rocks as well using the same glue. Um, and uh, I'll just do this, I think, I think I'm gonna do this in sections. I'm not sure whether I'm gonna do it all at once, try and get all of the wood and stones in, let that go off and then do the modeling compound. It might make more sense. But ultimately what's gonna happen is stones and rocks, modeling compound and then paint. So I'll set the camera up so that I could do a little bit of a time lapse on this so you can see how it works. Um, and um, I'm not gonna go into mixing the modeling compound. I've done it a hundred times. It's from um, the geek gaming, the stuff I buy little bit of water, mix it up, slap it on, it dries, it's great. Um, and you can also uh, make that quite nice in terms of um, texture for rock texture as well. So I'll set the, uh, a bit of a time lapse up for this next process. And the next thing that we'll do together will be painting. So I said the next thing I was gonna do would be painting, but I realized actually that I've missed a step. <laughs> so the modeling compound is in. You can see I've grouted and filled in around the edges. Uh, apologies if you hear any dogs in the background. I have the three of them in here in room 13 with me. But yes, so I've filled in around the, um, around the bark. What I'm now gonna do, yeah, that's that's Zena growling, <laughs> fighting with Louise. So what I'm now gonna do is come along. This is my watered down PVA. Um, and I'm going to do this quite liberally. Um, it's going to basically uh, apply a texture over all of the over all of the of the the, f the ground. Um, and I have my unsifted builder's sand, which is the same sand as I used inside, which I'm going to use outside. So it's the same technique basically. So I've lumped a load of PVA on, and what we do now is scatter the sand on like this. Yeah. And then I'll just take it off camera briefly, shake it. It doesn't take any longer than that to dry on enough. There we are. Then we come back and you can see we have a nice texture. 
So I'm going to do that all the way over it. I will probably add more edges. I might do the entirety of it. Um, and then that means I can then come along and paint it fine. So yeah, forgot to do that. So um, it's going to take a little bit of time, not a huge amount of time. I will not be doing the um, anywhere where I want it to look like finished stone. And uh, that will be the next thing that I'll do. And that will be being done with a grout mix, which is a finer, a finer texture. So uh, yeah, it'll just be the open rock. Um, and I even want to do the edges of the cliff as well. So this is going to take a little bit of time. It's going to have to be done in stages, uh, let to dry so I can actually move it around. Um, I'll probably do the whole of the top in one go and then prop it up and do one side, let that dry, prop it up, do the other side, let it dry. I might bring you along for those steps so you can see them because this sort of big build is quite hard to uh, approach if you're not, not sure what you're doing, but it's really easy. You just need to do it methodically, basically. So yeah, I'll probably bring you back for that, to be honest. So first of all, I'm gonna do the whole of the top and that's it because I can move that around really easily. I've got it on a tray. I don't even need to really touch it to move it. You can see I've got it on a baking tray, another top tip, They're really cool for building. So get that done and I'll bring you back for the next step when I come to do the sides. So I've done the top side, now I'm going to do this front edge. And like I said, i just like to show you how it is. Literally what I've got is a pot of paint at the bottom just to kind of hold it in place. Um, and it is as simple as, as that. It means that you're able to work on the sides without having to particularly hold the model very much. Though you can see I'm holding it a little bit here, but that's okay because this has actually been left overnight and so the stuff on top is, is perfectly dry, it's totally dry and solid, so it's not going to come off. So yeah, just prop it up, do a side, I'll probably leave that at least three or four hours to go off, and then what I'll do is I'll rotate it and do the other side, leave that three or four hours, and that means that roughly by tonight, if I keep going, if I don't get distracted, and I have time during the day, because it's early morning now, I will... Uh, I will have it done um, and then I can basically come along and paint in the same way tomorrow maybe paint over and cover the top uh, with a second coat of the glue just to seal it. So now that I've got some paint on there what I'll do is pick it up carefully and put the put the sand on it like this. There we are. It is as simple as that though easier for you because you won't be trying to film <laughs> and the film does trying to keep in shot does make it a bit more difficult so I'll turn the camera off now because it'll make it easier for me but that's how I do it so I'll work through the day rotating as I go and by the end of the day should have all the sides done as well here's another way of doing it so I've got Rosie's old baby bath <laughs> which as you can see is now very covered in paint and all sorts of stuff for multiple uses like this because this is a really useful thing for uh, if you want to collect when you don't want to spill all over the place because the previous technique and Zena's come to say hello hey Zena the previous technique does cause and can cause quite a lot of uh, spillages so if you put your what you're trying to um, cover with sand inside a large container like this if you've got an old baby bath it's a it's a good size. You're not normally making anything bigger than this, though I have done. <laughs> um, then you can basically throw your sand on without really worrying about where it goes because this has a good pore. It has a, a beak, this one. It's actually a duck or chicken. <laughs> um, so it's got a good beak, uh, which means it pours well. So you can pour anything that falls off straight back into your bucket. So we'll just do a small section on camera. Drop the... Uh, spoon got my sand here and you can see that i just don't have to care i really really can just slap it on without worrying and it's a very much easier technique than what i was doing before where i was trying to balance and what have you so there we are that might be a little bit of an easier technique so then what you can do is lift it out it falls in and there you are no spill off at all and nothing, no mess on the floor. So as you can see, I'm doing the second side now. So I'll finish that off. Um, and I think probably that is me done showing you on how I'm gonna do the texturing. So next up, we'll come back with the ground. Well, this is now really nicely stuck down and looking good. So the next step is to paint the 
final, the remaining exposed areas of foam with this, which is my grout mix. Now, if you want to know how I make it, uh, as I always say, there is a link in the description of every single one of my videos to a video showing you how I go about it, because it's not just grout. I add PVA and uh, sand and what have you, but go and check that video out. It's only one of my short ones. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint that all the way over the rest of the exposed base. So yeah, I'll just get that done. I'm not going to film it because, well, that's what I'm doing. Um, and uh, yeah, it dries quite quickly, so I might even be able to get on to the next stage tonight if I get time. And I'm going to find that there's going to be bits of polystyrene that actually is loose, so that's that's fine. But yeah, I'm just going to do one coat of this. Uh, I might I might do a second one. If I do, I'll let you know. But basically, just going to going to cover this whole thing with a. Uh, with this grout mix. So I'll get that done and I'll bring you back for the next step when I get to it. Well that took longer than expected, mainly because I ran out of the um, grout mixture, had to mix some more up, ran out of grout, so I had to fill, um, sift a load more down, which I did last night while watching some YouTube videos, uh, but I got that finished today. And what I'm now about to do is the next step, which is painting everything black. So I have my big pot of house paint, which is what I use. I'm not doing this mixed with anything. I've just got um, some a, a little pot of water and a big brush. And this is probably gonna take two coats as well. So I'm just gonna put a coat over absolutely everything. And Sean is going to be shouting at the screen, saying that rocks aren't black. But I'm following the instructions. And according to this instructions, they are. So I'm gonna give it a coat over everything of this black and then we will bring it back from black with dry brushing and other techniques afterwards. So I won't subject you to the painting of the whole thing. It is what you're seeing here. So uh, yeah, probably do two coats. Once I've done the two coats and got everything done, I'll bring you back for the next step. There we are. Right then, I actually only did one coat of the black and that's actually come out quite nicely. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do the dry brushing. And uh, this is kind of like a cheat code for, for terrain. If you've never done it before, then uh, the first time you do it, it'll blow your mind. So I've got two different um, greys. Sorry for getting my arm, arm in the way. I'll move my paper over here. Um, I've got two different greys, I've got a dark grey and a lighter grey. First of all I'm going to do the darker grey. And the darker grey is applied a little bit heavier than the, than the lighter grey. Almost, you're almost painting it on, but not quite. That's actually probably a little bit too much, but it'll be okay. So what you're doing is, you're coming along, you're not trying to add, uh, you're not trying to paint it or fill in all the deep, dark recesses of the model. But what you are looking at doing um, with this colour, with this grey, is bringing up from it being very, very dark, which is obviously the black is very, very dark, to actually a slightly easier to apply other colours to, basically. This is what I'm going to do here, because I'm not going to leave this black and white. There's going to be all sorts of things going on, browns and greens and oranges and what have you. Because, yeah, you do want to have some variety in your... Uh, in your terrain but basically a big brush like this and we're going to cover the entire model in roughly the same application which will then bring out a lot of the highlights and uh, will as I say mean that it's a little bit easier to actually apply different colors to it because black is a very very saturated color obviously so I'm gonna get that done it won't take long but you've basically seen everything I'm gonna be doing I've got a paper towel which is what I'm taking most of the paint off on before I apply it to the model. Um, so yeah, I'll get that done. I'll bring you back when I've finished this and I'm about to start the next step, which will be the lighter gray. And then we'll be looking at doing other colors and flocks and grass and tufts and all sorts of fun stuff. So just get this done and I'll bring you back very shortly. So the dark gray has gone on and looks great. The next stage, is very much more a dry brush and it's with the lighter grey. So 
The thing with this is that you don't really see the effect of it until after it's dried. So you put it on, as you can see, and it looks like nothing's happening. But top tip, come back to it in 10 minutes. It dries very quickly. Just don't overdo it because otherwise you'll end up just painting over the top of the light gray and you won't actually bring out any highlights. The reason for this is is because this gray, while it's wet, is basically the same color as the gray that you put on before, or the gray that I put on before, before it dries. So uh, once it's dried, so, so they basically look the same. They, they can't really see that I've added anything to it, but you really have. So uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't worry if it looks like you're not having any effect, just, uh, just keep going. And after a couple of minutes, and you can already see actually, uh, I can already see it drying out, you can see that you are bringing out a highlight. So it's a little bit one of one of those where you want to be a little bit patient um, and not worry too much about what your eyes are showing you, just trust the technique and trust the process. It's also a very quick one, though this is quite a big model, so it's taken a little bit longer, but it doesn't take very long to do because you're not looking at filling in the gap, so you're doing it quite very, very light dry brush. Very light dry brush. Anyway, I'm muttering because normally I've done this stage by now, <laughs> but such a big, big model that it's going to take a little bit longer than normal. So I'll get the rest of it done and uh, bring you back for the next step, which is going to be whites and other colours, just to make it interesting. We're nearly done on this now. This is rushing to completion. So that's that done, and that's a really effective little highlight there, which is all you're doing really is looking at catching where the light is hitting uh, the tops a little bit more. What I'm going to do now is I've got my dark brown, chocolate brown, and I want to have some areas where there's some soil and grass growing, not many but some. So what I'm going to do is come along with the chocolate brown, let's just say that it's going to go here next to this rock, which is probably right, probably legitimate, that's where you'd expect there to be a little bit of an accumulation or an accretion of soil. Just come in and with a, a light dry brush I've just put a brown patch. So I'm going to do that in a couple of places, not too many, but I do want there to be some green and I want there to be some contrast going on, um, not just black and white and grey, which is a bit boring to look at. But I want there to be some areas where I can say there's soil there, and then what I can do is put some green flock in and, and, and highlight up and bring that area out a little bit more with some different some different colours. So yeah, just gonna pick a few little areas in each zone where this is gonna be the case. And it just adds that little bit of realism when you start to drop a tiny uh, patch of a uh, tuft or or whatever on there. So uh, that's pretty much done. That's how quick that is. I'm not sure I'm going to do very much more. I did some there. There we are. A little bit there. There we are. A little bit. Just a little bit. Not very much. Um, don't overdo it because this is a rocky outcropping and uh, would not have lots and lots of soil. But that should be enough, so we've got little patches of brown. So what we can now do is, and I will just keep the camera running, because why not? I'm going to grab one of my um, shop bought flocks, as it happens, and just put the, uh, put the paint away, grab a different paintbrush, and we will use the terrain glue, which is, there was a video below on how I make it, it's watered down PVA, simple as that and I will pop a little bit of terrain glue over the top of some of this dry brush brown. So I'll do it in two places. There. And then scatter on a teeny tiny bit of my, of my flock. Not much, because I want to still see the soil underneath. And that there has will give a really nice little splash of colour which will just alleviate as you can see from this bit here it just alleviates the the, the monotone of the, of the rest of the, of the piece so I'll do that across all the other bits that I've just painted um, and then bring it back for the next step which will be tufts 
So now for the finishing touches, uh, what I'm going to do is I've got this material here which I really love for using for making like uh, kind of brambly type stuff. I've got the official brambly stuff from uh, uh, Woodland Scenics but it's not very hard wearing. It's good for model railways but not for gaming. This, as you can see, you pull it off and that is going to look really, really good as a bit of a, a, a shrubbery or bushes that's growing up against this wall here out of that little bit of greenery so I, I would love to know what it's called I think someone might have told me once but I for life me can't remember but it's something uh, I buy it from the uh, hardware store from the uh, home improvement store and I think it's used for like scrubbing and um, uh, like scrubbing plaster to uh, give it a rough or for roughing up plaster that you're then going to paint or something like that um, but it comes on a on like a a sheet this is uh, and I tear it up and uh, yeah it works really really well for for this kind of thing so I'm just going to pop a little bit of this here and there it'll look a little bit like um, like vines or what have you that's too much glue and uh, yeah it's going to look really good now I've accidentally put some onto that which does actually follow on with the next technique that I want to do but I wasn't going to do it yet so I'll come back to that in a second while I make use of this final bit of glue on my fingers and uh, put a little bit more of this greenery I don't know let's have it here let's have it there there we are so the next thing that I'm going to do is actually make use of the same flock I've been staring at this wondering what was wrong with it and I'm going to make use of the same flock as I used on the ground and I'm actually going to scatter it so that it's falling down and grows so it looks like ivy or what have you um, coming down the side of the of this little bit of cliff or this not cliff this upright so when I shake that off which I will do in a second that will look like ivy or mold or what have you so I'm going to do this around the rest of the book of the of the build uh, put little bits more on of like this on the uprights put a little bit more of this material just around a couple more areas and then we'll wrap the build up I've really enjoyed this Well, there we are. So good to get back in the saddle and get back to these Battle Games Middle Earth builds. Really enjoyed making that. Another nice long video if you've made it this far. I do appreciate it. Uh, but yeah, making something and finishing it. This is a win uh, after the failure from the previous one. I'm not sure what I'm going to do about that. Still not decided. I've still got everything in a box. And uh, yeah, I, I'll probably just move on because the next month's video is going to be a particularly special one. A little bit of a collaboration with another awesome YouTuber um, and a bit of a different video. Not making something this time around. But we'll be back um, in two months with another build. I'll be doing the next magazine. I've had a look at it, really excited about it. So yeah, hoping to, uh, hoping to finish that one. Uh, really appreciate the fact that you've made it this far. Like I say, if you have, let me know if you build along. Let me know if you've enjoyed this, what you've been doing while you've been watching it. And uh, yeah, it'd be good to hear from you. I love all the comments that I receive. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And as always, please stay healthy, stay safe and stay well.